Hello students, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Bajra of IAS Academy. So, in this session, we will discuss some of the most important and relevant news articles for today's, uh, you know, so they are actually given in the Hindu newspaper. Okay, before actually uh, discussing all these important news articles, please subscribe to Bajra of IAS Academy YouTube channel and also hit the bell icon so that you will get all important and relevant updates regarding different classes. Okay, so these are the list of very important and relevant news articles. So the first one is a long drawn test for India's diplomatic skills. Okay, so why this article has been given is because we all know that Prime Minister Narendra Modi is visiting Japan. Okay, he is visiting Japan. Why he is visiting Japan is because uh, he is invited for the G7 meeting and that has been taking place in Hiroshima, a city in Japan okay that has been taking place in Hiroshima so apart from the G7 meeting we have a set of different uh, meetings which we uh, which will take place in India itself for example uh, India is current president of G20 India is also holding the chair of Shanghai Cooperation Organization now, apart from that Prime Minister Narendra Modi will also attend the BRICS meeting in South Africa and will fly to uh, USA in June and after that Prime Minister Narendra Modi will also attend the Bastille Day in uh, France and will also uh, you know go to several other European Union countries so because of the diplomatic activity we also need diplomatic skills and that will help maintain India's stature at the global stage the next article is India must invest in infrastructure that actually boosts defense against disasters. Recently, we come across the Cyclone Mocha. Okay, Cyclone Mocha. Now, this cyclone has made a landfall in Myanmar. Okay, so this also has resulted in the death of around 60 people. Now, when we do not have resilience against such disasters, then that would resulted that would result in huge economic losses and also loss of lives so therefore this article has emphasized on increasing the resilience of our infrastructure so that the disasters would have a minimal impact on the economic uh, side and also the loss of lives the next article is with respect to the green deposits we will understand what are green deposits how the green deposits are different from the actual deposits which we make in Banks. Recently, RBI has come up with rules regarding governing the green deposits. So we will understand all these rules. Now, Tamil Nadu's uh, amended law on Jallikattu valid. So recently, Supreme Court has a uh, Supreme Court Constitution bench has come up with a judgment on the Jallikattu, uh, you know, uh, petition. So uh, the Supreme Court judgment says that Jallikattu is a valid sport. What is a Jallikattu? Jallikattu is a a bull taming sport okay bull taming sport and that usually takes place in the state of Tamil Nadu okay that usually takes place in the state of Tamil Nadu so earlier there was a, a tussle between Union government Supreme Court uh, the Tamil Nadu government and several other animal uh, conservation groups over the Jallikattu and uh, the violation of animal rights so finally Supreme Court has come up with a judgment saying that the Jallikattu is valid now, the last article is with respect to the lumpy skin diseases. Okay, lumpy skin disease. Now, lumpy skin disease is impacting cattle significantly in India. Now, when it impacts cattle, it will also have a huge economic losses and it will also reduce the productivity on the part of the cattle. So, therefore, we will also understand what exactly the cause of the lumpy skin disease whether it is a zoonotic disease or not. So what is a zoonotic disease? Zoonotic disease is a disease which actually transmit from animal to human being. Okay, so these are all the uh, relevant and very important news articles we will discuss in this lecture. Now the first article is with respect to the, uh, the diplomatic skills, a long drawn test for India's diplomatic skills. So no doubt there will be a test for India's diplomatic skills okay India's diplomatic skills now we will understand this article first so what this article has been saying now Prime Minister Narendra Modi 
is going uh, is embarking on a week long visit and he will visit japan papua new guinea australia from may 19 so that is actually today now papua new guinea australia japan were actually countries which are part of the indo pacific now prime minister narendra modi will participate in the g7 meeting as an invitee and after that he will also visit papua new guinea and australia now this visit is coming at a significant time where the world looks uneasy okay why world looks uneasy because of uh, the geopolitical challenge from china is one such reason so how because chinese assertiveness chinese belligerence uh, with its bordering countries and uh, even in the indian ocean and claiming territory claiming uh, the rights over the south china sea so all have been posing the geopolitical challenges from china and secondly there were worries over trade access for example european union recently passed carbon border adjustment mechanism now this places trade restrictions okay this will place a trade restrictions on indian products which are exported to european union so it will not just impact the indian products but it will also impact the products from the global south and also the least developed and the developing country so therefore the second uh, aspect which is a concern is trade access and the third one is the supply chain reliability so during covid-19 pandemic during covid-19 pandemic it is effectively proved that we do not have uh, you know effective supply chain resilience because several countries have dependent on other countries for their supply chain so therefore supply chain resilience is one of the aims or the one of the objectives of not just india but the entire world for example india dependent on china for active pharmaceutical ingredients so we import active pharmaceutical ingredients from china so apart from that we also dependent on chips okay we also dependent on chips from china so so several such products we are uh, directly or indirectly dependent on china so india ha- along with other countries have been focusing on achieving the supply chain resilience so the final aspect is food and energy security so particularly after the ukraine russia war there has been concerns with respect to the food and energy security so this is also creating a global challenge now please understand the shanghai cooperation organization okay this is uh, with respect to the shanghai cooperation organization now global geopolitical experts have been perceiving shanghai cooperation organization as an anti west organization okay anti west organization so why they are seeing it as an anti west organization because shanghai cooperation organization has members like russia china iran and in fact myanmar as observer okay in fact myanmar is also observer of shanghai cooperation organization so we all know that in myanmar there was a military junta or military regime which is in power and in fact the us along with several other countries in the west have imposed sanctions on the military officials first secondly in iran also us imposed sanctions and us also uh, exited the you know Uh, the joint comprehensive plan of action joint comprehensive plan of action now after that usa uh, imposed sanctions on iran and uh, after that iran and uh, usa have maintained tense relations and uh, due to russia ukraine war also there were a uh, unilateral sanctions on russia and there were tensions between china and usa relations so because of this reason the shanghai cooperation organization is being increasingly seen as an anti west grouping okay anti west grouping now if you understand the significance of the shanghai cooperation organization in fact it is the world's it it ho- houses the world's largest population and the fastest growing ma- major economies are part of the shanghai cooperation organization and it is also home to the huge energy resources this is a particularly significance of the shanghai cooperation organization however please understand the shanghai cooperation organization council of foreign ministers meeting okay so scvo council of 
foreign ministers meeting and that meeting has actually took place okay so this meeting took place in goa last week okay this meeting took place in goa last week however in this meeting uh, the uh, the bilateral relationship between pakistan and india the bilateral relationship between china and india and bilateral relationship between russia and china, uh, russia and china have dominated or overshadowed the substantive multilateral outcomes which uh, have to which ought to take place during the shanghai cooperation organization council for foreign ministers meeting however since this meeting has substantially dominated with the bilateral relationship the central asian republics which are also part of the shanghai cooperation organization they are actually unhappy about the outcome or about uh, the uh, dominance of the bilateral relationship uh, of a very few countries in the shanghai cooperation organization foreign uh, ministers meeting okay so uh, if you uh, understand the central asian republic countries like uh, kazakhstan uzbekistan Turkmenistan and the Tajikistan to so Kyrgyzstan these countries are part of the Shanghai cooperation organization and they are also known as so these countries are also known as the central asian republics okay these countries are also known as the central asian republics okay so because of the dominance of the bilateral relationship the central asian republics are unhappy okay so this is about the shanghai cooperation organization now apart from the shanghai cooperation organization why uh, uh, the author has been suggesting that there is a long drawn test for india's diplomatic skills india's diplomatic skills because see we have discussed that uh, in uh, prime minister narendra modi is attending the g7 summit as a g7 summit as a an invitee now apart from g7 we also have the other diplomatic activity in india this year itself this year itself so if you remember india is currently the president of the g20 summit and india also holds the chair of shanghai cooperation organization now shanghai cooperation organization meeting will take place this year and g20 meeting will also take place this year so apart from these two summits prime minister narendra modi will also attend the brics summit which will take place in you uh, which will take place in the south africa okay this will take place in south africa and in this meeting prime minister narendra modi along with all other g uh, brics countries will discuss the brics payment mechanism okay so all these countries have been mooting over the idea of an alternative okay mooting over the idea of an alternative to the dollar dominated financial system okay dollar dominated financial system and they are trying to bring a brics payment mechanism where the payments among the brics countries made through the very same mechanism okay payments are made through the very same mechanism okay now currently the international financial system is dominated by dollar okay now apart from the brics g20 shanghai cooperation organization meeting prime minister narendra modi will also prime minister narendra modi will also visit the france also visit france and several other european union countries okay so he will also attend the bastille day parade in france now after that in september mr modi will host every global leader at the g20 summit in delhi and because of all these activities india's diplomatic skills will be tested again right so as of now india is following the balancing act okay india's balancing act so what is a balancing act balancing act is india's independent foreign policy or india's independence independent decision making capabilities for example india follows the policy of strategic autonomy okay strategic autonomy now in strategic autonomy indian foreign policy is not aligned to the interests of any country rather it is aligned to interests of its own uh, nation okay so it is aligned to the national interests of india so therefore 
it is said that the strategic autonomy or india's balancing act is a huge success or it has been giving the dividends okay it has been giving dividends why because after the russia ukraine war despite a huge pressure from the west india followed the balancing act india followed its policy of strategic autonomy it has not aligned either with the west or not aligned with the russia as well so therefore india has been largely successful in its balancing act okay so in fact india has become a role model for the balancing act of following the policy of strategic autonomy why because several countries in southeast asia and in global south so they are following the policy of strategic autonomy so more clearly and more visibly saudi arabia united arab emirates turkey so these countries have been following the policy of strategic autonomy because of the russia ukraine war and they did not align with any major power okay so they are looking for their own interests so finally this article has been suggesting that because of the flurry of the diplomatic activity in terms of various summits uh, which india hosts and prime minister narendra modi's bilateral visit to us france european union and g7 as an invitee and also the brics summit it is very important for india to show its diplomatic skill okay so if india shows its diplomatic skill uh, if its diplomatic skill its a stature at the global level can be maintained and it can project itself as a more responsible it can project itself as a more responsible power ready to sh- uh, shoulder the responsibilities ready to shoulder the global responsibilities and that is actually the you know duty of a uh, any power which is aspiring to become a, a global leader okay so this is all about this article now we need to understand the countries which are part of the g20 grouping g8 and the g7 grouping so in our previous classes i have discussed this several times so countries which are part of uh, g7 include germany uk france canada us italy japan now earlier russia also joined the g7 grouping and after that it became g8 grouping okay so after that it has become the g8 grouping however in the year 2014 russia annexed crimea okay russia annexed crimea which is actually part of ukraine so after russia's annexation of crimea russia was expelled out of the g8 grouping and it has become the g7 grouping now in g8 grouping russia was also part now we discussed what is the reason for uh, g8 becoming g7 now what are the countries which are part of the g20 in g20 all the g7 countries are members please remember that and along with the g7 russia is also part of g20 now after russia countries like turkey european union european union is not a country but it is uh, it is a collective representation of european union and it is also part of the g20 grouping so please go through all the countries which are part of the g20 grouping because it is very important now the next uh, article is with respect to global warming okay so the next article is with respect to global warming now the world meteorological organization uh, has come up with an annual update on the scenarios of a climate change or the global warming and important relevant data on global warming and statistics okay so the annual update on projections for temperature trends in the next decade okay so this data is actually published by world meteorological organization right so it has come up with a, a data or it has come up with an annual update on projections of temperature trend in the next decade right so it says that the annual mean global near surface temperatures for each year between 2023 and 2027 is likely to be 1.1 degree to 1.8 degree celsius okay so it this temperature will be higher than the 
average temperatures in the year 1850 to 1900 okay so this is around 1.1 degree celsius to 1.8 degree celsius higher than the global average in 1850s to 1900 now please remember in cop 21 of the paris climating paris climating so we have set the target of limiting the global warming to 2 degrees celsius if possible 1.5 degrees celsius okay so because climate change and global warming will have a huge consequences for us okay it will question our existence itself okay it will question our survival as well and it will it may lead to the a uh, severe consequences and earth will experience the sixth mass extinction as well so because of this reason we already reached around 1.1 degree celsius to 1.8 degree celsius in the next decade so therefore there is an urgent need to act upon reducing the rising levels of greenhouse gases now apart from this interesting data on increasing climate change a global warming there is also some other data okay so it says that there is a 66 percentage chance that the global near surface temperatures will exceed 1.5 degree celsius below pre-industrial levels okay so there is a very high chance that within next decade itself the global warming will increase or the temperatures the surface temperatures will increase above 1.5 degree celsius so this has been showing that we are not acting we are not acting enough our policies have not been resulting the significant gains in terms of reducing the climate change the global warming so therefore if it has incre it is if it increases above 1.5 degree celsius then it will have a disastrous consequences on global warming okay now for example hotter oceans also mean stronger cyclones one of the main factor which drives cyclones one of the main factor which actually drives cyclones is the hot climate hot sea surface temperatures okay hot sea surface temperatures this actually results in origin of cyclones and this also results in you know uh, driving cyclones more intensely when temperatures have been increasing continuously there is a possibility that more cyclones will originate in the arabian sea and also in bay of bengal also so after originating such cyclones their intensity will further increase okay so if their intensity increases that will result in a huge destruction and this will have a huge uh, disastrous consequences uh, it will result in economic losses loss of lives for example a cyclone mocha cyclone mocha and that has made a landfall in myanmar okay so it has claimed 60 lives and it has also brought severe damage and it is ended up being more stronger than expected so it is expected that the cyclone is not stronger enough but however by the end of the time the cyclone has become more and more intense and it is become a very severe cyclone a very severe cyclone and it is being uh, you know linked to the global warming it is being linked to the global warming and high sea surface temperatures because of this reason the intensity of this cyclone has increased many fold now in recent times india's abilities at forecasting cyclones and weather anomalies have significantly improved okay we improved our capabilities in weather forecasting or cyclone forecasting and also forecasting the weather, you know, weather anomalies have increased or improved but we need to focus on developing resilience okay so we need to focus on developing resilience is far more challenging because we are not investing more on developing resilient infrastructure okay so we have to focus on building back better we have to focus on the disaster resilient or the climate resilient infrastructure now we need to make greater investments in bolstering 
disaster related infrastructure and it is actually the need of the hour because the world meteorological organization data is already showing that we are breaching the set limits of the paris climate deal now global warming and climate change we need to understand the causes and effects of global warming and climate change now what causes the greenhouse gas emissions what causes the greenhouse gas emissions the main cause of greenhouse gas emissions is fossil fuels fossil fuels and also industrialization industrialization deforestation and agriculture agriculture releases methane okay so methane is one of the greenhouse gases now agriculture fossil fuels and deforestation are the main sources of the greenhouse gases now some of the greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide methane nitrous oxide water vapor so these are some of the greenhouse gases now how these greenhouse gases impact the atmosphere or the environment now increasing co2 levels leads to ocean acidification now ocean acidification will further give a thrust to or further give boost to the increasing sea surface temperatures okay increasing sea surface temperatures now sea surface temperatures have been increasing and that will lead to the increasing origin of cyclones and increasing intensity of cyclones and also several uh, biodiversity the marine biodiversity a sea life would face it impossible to survive okay now the water vapor methane are also the greenhouse gases now what are the causes associated with the greenhouse gases we need to understand now with the increasing greenhouse gases it leads to the snow cover reduction okay and there will be a less sunlight reflection see there is a concept called albedo okay there is a concept called albedo now with the higher albedo the higher sunlight will be reflected okay higher amount of sunlight will be reflected back to the atmosphere when higher amount of sunlight reflected back to the atmosphere then the snow cover could be protected however when the snow cover is absorbing more and more sunlight more and more heat then there is a probability that melting glaciers that will lead to melting of glaciers and ice and that ultimately lead to the sea level rise now apart from that the water vapor will increase and permafrost melt and methane release now what are the effects on the environment because of the global warming it will lead to the habitat destruction ecosystem collapse arctic barrier reef or fringing barrier reef in great barrier reef in australia is one such example and this will also lead to the biodiversity loss species extinction and the spread of invasive alien species okay it will also lead to spread of invasive alien species and that pose threat to the biodiversity okay now apart from that it will also intensify weather events like wildfires droughts floods storms and heat now after that it will also lead to the glacial retreat ice sheet melt fresh water loss desertification and it will also have impacts like coral bleaching fish stock decline sea level rise coastal submer submergence and disease carrier pest pro propagation for example due to increasing sea surface temperatures the disease causing uh, the disease causing effects will also increase or the pest propagation will also increase okay so this will also directly have an impact on human health now because of all these events it will lead to flooding cities and farmlands crop failure and crop losses direct physical harm to human beings and also human migration and conflict so these are some of the harmful effects of the increasing global warming levels now we have to understand the impact of rising levels impact of rising levels of greenhouse gases on india now according to some data 40% of indians will face water scarcity by the year 2050 so this is actually a data from ipcc report intergovernmental panel on climate change data 
So this data on India has been suggesting that 40% of Indians will face severe water crisis by the year 2050. Now, apart from that, there will be an increase in annual mean precipitation. Okay, so increase in annual mean precipitation will lead to the, uh, you know, flood-like conditions. So there will be increase in rainfall will be more severe over southern parts of India. And rainfall could increase around 20% on the southwest coast compared to 1850 and 1900s. And apart from this, the monsoon precipitation projected to increase in mid-long term over South Asia. So this will lead to increasing amount of floods and economic losses. Now, after that, the rising temperatures and precipitation can increase the appearance of glacial lake outburst. Okay, so the glacial lake outburst will lead to floods and landslides and over the moraine domain dammed lakes. So after that, the snow line elevation will rise and glacier volumes will also decline. The regional mean sea level will continue to rise. So rising mean sea level will lead to the submergence of coastal cities. For example, cities in India will be experiencing more heat stress. Okay, apart from submergence, cities in India will also experience more heat stress and it will lead to urban floods, salinity ingress due to sea level rise and other climate induced hazards like cyclones. Now, India is also expected to see an increase in the frequency of hot and extremes. It will lead to the forest fires and also the wildfires and that will further uh, you know defragment the forests okay forests uh, they, the, that will further uh, make forests more and more uh, you know uh, uh, defragmentation will take place now apart from that india is one of the most vulnerable countries globally in terms of the pollution uh, cities which will be affected by the sea level rise include mumbai Kolkata, Chennai, Goa, Cochin, Puri, among others. Okay. So the data also suggesting that by the middle of the century, 35 million people in India will face the coastal flooding. Okay. Now after that, it will also come up with huge economic costs because of the sea level rise and the river flooding. Now direct damage is estimated to be around 24 billion. Okay. So, direct damage due to the environmental impacts is estimated to be around 24 billion. Now, climate change and rising demand mean that about 40% of the people in India will live with the water scarcity by 2050 compared to 33% now. The rivers, the major rivers, both Ganges and Brahmaputra river basins will also see increased levels of flooding as a result of climate change, particularly if it passes 1.5 degrees Celsius and it will also impact the productivity of food crops that includes maize okay that includes maize wheat and rice so these are the impacts of increasing global warming on India okay particularly on India now the next news article is with respect to the Jallikattu okay Jallikattu now what is Jallikattu before actually discussing this article we need to understand what is a Jallikattu? So Jallikattu is actually a bull, bull taming sport. Okay, this is a bull taming sport and it is practiced in the state of Tamil Nadu. So according to Tamil Nadu government, it is part of their culture and it is practiced since last one century or 100 years. Okay, so Jallikattu is also known as Eruta Jovatal. Okay, Eruta Jovatal. This is a bull taming sport. And it is traditionally played in the state of Tamil Nadu and it is played on the eve of the Pongal Harvest Festival. Okay. Now this festival is celebrated, is celebration of nature and is actually a thanksgiving for a bountiful harvest. So cattle worship is also part of the festival. Okay. They also worship the cattle during the festival. However, the practice of Jallikattu has long been contested. Why it is contested? Because animal rights groups have been protesting that it is a violation of animal rights. Okay, so it very often leads to 
the harassment of the animals of physical harm being caused to animals okay so animal rights groups and the court express, expressing concern over the cruelty to animals and the bloody and dangerous nature of the sport sometimes lead to the death of the animals and even uh, you know a threats to human life so because of all these reasons chellikattu is very often a contested sport now we have to understand the you know the timeline of the chellikattu okay for example in the year 2006 a bench of madurai high court gives directions to regulate the conduct of chellikattu okay so because since it is violation of animal rights and it is also cruelty it is considered as a cruelty on the part of animal there was a direction from the madurai high court gives and madurai high court gives direction to regulate the conduct of chellikattu and secondly in the year 2009 the state government enacted the tamil nadu regulation of chellikattu act 2009 okay so this will regulate sport by imposing relevant conditions to protect the animal and the human lives so in this context we need to understand one thing okay so for example prevention of cruelty against animals okay prevention of cruelty against animals is list is in the concurrent list so it is in the concurrent list when a particular item is listed in the concurrent list both center and states have the power to make a law on this subject okay so taking the power from the uh, prevention of animal uh, prevention of cruelty to animals act from uh, animals in the concurrent list the state government of tamil nadu enacts tamil nadu regulation of chellikattu act 2009 to regulate sport by imposing relevant conditions and these relevant conditions will help protect the animal so in november 2010 supreme court lets tamil nadu government to permit jellikattu for 5 months okay so in a year they will conduct jellikattu in 5 months okay so supreme court also given directions to the district collectors to ensure that the bulls are registered with the animal welfare board of india okay so animal welfare board of india was established by the animal welfare the prevention of cruelty to animals act 1960 so that was enacted in the year 1960 to prevent cruelty to animals and the animal welfare board of india was established as per the act now in july 2011 center issues a notification banning use of bull performing animal in may 2014 supreme court strikes down tamil nadu law okay tamil nadu also passed a law and supreme court strikes down tamil nadu law and bans chellikattu altogether in the year 2014 however in the year 2016 the center issues a notification to lift ban okay so it wanted to lift the ban and says bulls may be continued to be exhibited but trained as a performing animal at events such as chellikattu in tamil nadu this is actually a notice from the center government lifting ban on the jellikattu sport okay now please understand so why it is in news jellikattu took a uh, place with uh, you know during the pongal celebration in tamil nadu it has been banned several times in the past years as well okay in the past years also it is banned several times now what is jellikattu we already understood the jellikattu this is a, a bull taming festival that used to take place during the sankranti or during pongal which is a festival a harvest festival in the state of tamil nadu okay pongal is a harvest festival or a thanksgiving festival thanksgiving festival okay for the uh, harvest okay bumper harvest now chellikattu is a traditional event in which bull is released into the crowd of people and multiple human participants attempt to grab the large hump on the bull's back so you can see here this is hump okay this is hump and people try to you know grab the hump of the bull and this is part of the game secondly participant hold the hump for as long as possible and attempt to bring the bull to stop okay so they hold the hump and they attempt to stop the bull in some cases 
participants must write long enough to remove flags on the pulse forms okay so they you know they travel with the hump of a bull and they remove the flags which are actually uh, in the bull's horns the origin of the sport jallikattu has been known to be practiced during tamil classical period now it was common among the ir people who lived in the mullai geographical division of tamil nadu now why it is banned so there were incidents of injury and death associated with sport not just injury and death for the human being but also it amounts to the cruelty against the animal even the animal rights activists were considered that it is brutal practice on bulls okay now what a supreme court says on this okay what supreme court uh, says on this the supreme court on thursday terminated jellikattu this is a type of bovine sport okay so that is existing in tamil nadu for at least a century and supreme court did not intervene with the state legislature finding that bull taming event is part of the cultural heritage and tradition of the people so since a uh, supreme court has not intervened with the states finding that bull taming is even uh, bull taming event is part of the cultural heritage and tradition of the people the supreme court said that it is legally valid or constitutionally valid now a constitution bench has been constituted to decide this matter whether it is violation of the uh, animal rights or not okay it has upheld the validity of prevention of cruelty to animals okay so it has upheld the validity of prevention of cruelty to animals tamil nadu amendment act which was passed in the year 2017 right so this legislation is passed for the you know regulated conduct of jellikattu without actually violating the rights of the animals and secondly tamil nadu has also come up with prevention of cruelty to animals conduct of jellikattu rules 2017 both the prevention of cruelty to animal rules and prevention of cruelty to animals act tamil nadu so these rules have been upheld by the supreme court okay so these rules were upheld by the supreme court so therefore the supreme court has given val- uh, a legal recognition for the jallikattu sport now the court has also found a similar laws already passed by karnataka and maharashtra so they allow these legislations allow bullock cart races and buffalo racing for example kambala okay so kambala you may have seen this sport in kantara movie okay so that is kambala movie now karnataka and maharashtra governments have also passed similar such legislations for allowing the bullock cart races and buffalo racing in their respective states now the court has also said that they those legislations are also valid now constitution bench held that jallikattu law substantially the law this law the prevention of cruelty to animals tamil nadu amendment act 2017 and prevention of cruelty to animals conduct of jellicut rules 2017 they substantially minimizes the pain and suffering of these animals who are participating in this event so since they are substantially minimizing the pain and suffering of animals participating uh, in this event so jellicut is considered as valid okay jellicut two other legislations are valid and in fact supreme court also upheld the practice of jellicut two however jellikattu was banned by the supreme court itself in the year 2014 okay supreme court banned jellikattu in the year 2014 okay so in the case uh, a nagaraja case in a nagaraja case the supreme court termed jellikattu as cruel okay so but but actually this uh, 2014 judgment given by the supreme court before the two legislations uh, the the law the prevention of cruelty to animals law was not yet passed this is actually passed in the year 2017 okay this is actually passed in the year 2017 but the nagaraja case judgment by supreme court termed jellikattu as cruel was delivered in the year 2014 okay so since the tamil nadu government have come up with the 2017 legislation and the rules also the supreme court says that the legislation the jellikattu law substantially minimizes the pain and suffering of 
the animals which are part of this event okay and this law this legislation has also introduced several measures and these measures prevent any abuse to the participating bulls and loss of human life okay so finally the amendment act overcomes this 2017 amendment act overcomes defects which are pointed in the a nagaraja judgment by the supreme court in the year 2014 okay so this is all about the jallikattu case now the next article is with respect to green deposits okay green deposits so what are the green deposits for example a, a, an individual deposit money okay an individual deposit money in a bank okay so this particular individual deposit some amount of money in a bank now green deposit is not different from the uh, normal deposit in a bank so the very same individual can deposit for example there is a separate green deposit separate a green deposit account whatever money being deposited into the green deposit account will be used for the renewable energy product okay renewable ener financing renewable energy projects for example waste management solar uh, production wind generation etc okay so green deposits are not very different from the regular deposits that banks accept in their customers okay there is no significant difference between normal deposits and green deposits so only major difference is that banks promise to earmark the money that they receive as green deposits towards the environment friendly projects okay so whatever money being earmarked for for the green deposits and they will use the money to finance the environment friendly projects for example a bank may promise that green deposits will be used towards financing renewable energy projects okay so they these projects will help fight the climate change i hope you understood what is a green deposit and a normal deposit so when uh, it comes to a normal deposit this can be used either for uh, you know a green purposes or non green purposes or any other purposes but when it comes to green deposit it should be mandatorily used for green projects it should be mandatorily used for green projects for example uh, you know an acknowledgement form asks uh, a person who have the bank account that his deposits in a bank should be used for uh, you know a green deposits so if he is given his uh, approval for that then those deposits will be used for financing the green projects okay now a bank a bank may also avoid using green deposits to invest in fossil fuel projects okay it may also it may not uh, also invest in fossil fuel projects and that are considered harmful to the climate okay so this will help avoid green deposits to invest in fossil fuel projects now green deposit is just one product in a wide array of other financial products because there are also other green products for example the green bonds green shares so they will help investors put money into the environmentally sustainable projects next recently rbi has come up with a regulatory framework with respect to the green uh, you know uh, green deposits okay so what this rbi's regular framework says about the green deposits it says that banks will will have to disclose the regular information about the amount of green deposits received and how these deposits were allocated towards various green projects secondly a third party will have to verify the claims which are made by banks regarding projects in which banks invest their green deposits okay so and it will also uh, you know audit the sustainability credentials of these business projects now third rbi has come up with a list of sectors so the sectors include renewable energy waste management clean transportation energy efficiency and afforestation so these sectors are considered as green sectors and they are more sustainable and they are eligible to receive green deposits and the rbi has also come up with a set of sectors which are actually banks are barred from investing green deposits in business projects that they involve fossil fuels nuclear energy 
tobacco, gambling, palm oil, hydropower generation. So green deposits will not be used for financing the below, below mentioned sectors. Now the next important news article is with respect to the lumpy skin disease. Okay, lumpy skin disease. Now in our previous classes also we have discussed uh, the lumpy skin disease. Okay, so the lumpy skin disease, why it is in news? It is in news. Uh, first we need to understand the lumpy skin disease. What exactly is the lumpy skin disease? Now lumpy skin disease is an infection uh, on of cattle or water buffalo with the pox virus lumpy skin disease. Okay, so this is actually caused by the pox virus lumpy skin uh, disease virus. Now, Zambia was the first country to experience the epidemic of lumpy skin disease in the year 1929. Now, how this disease transmit among the cattle? The lumpy skin disease is primarily spread between animals by biting insects such as mosquitoes and biting flies. So, if a mosquito or the biting fly so bites the cattle, then the lumpy skin disease will transmit to the cattle. Now, symptoms of the lumpy skin disease include fever, fluid discharge from the eyes, noses, saliva, dribbling from the lips and body blisters. Now, after infected with the lumpy skin disease, animal stops eating and it will also have difficulty in chewing or eating and it will lower the milk production and it will result in substantial economic losses, substantial economic losses and it will also have huge impact on livelihoods of small and marginal farmers along with women dairy farmers, women dairy farmers. Okay, so the method of prevention and treatment of lumpy skin disease include vaccination against these diseases covered under the livestock health and disease control program in India. Okay, so there is a separate program called livestock health and disease control program and as per the program, the vaccine of lumpy skin disease is covered. So there is currently no particular antiviral medication which is available for lumpy skin condition. The only treatment available is supportive care of cattle. Okay, so this is all about the lumpy skin disease. In fact, uh, in case the cattle is infected with the lumpy skin disease, you can see the symptoms on the skin of uh, the cattle. Okay, so how? Now, this ultimately impacts the productivity, the milk productivity of the cattle. Now, why it is in use? Center pushes vaccination as lumpy skin ravages the cattle. Okay. In recent times, there has been a substantial increase in the cases, number of cases of lumpy skin disease among cattle, especially in the states of Maharashtra, Uttarakhand, okay, Maharashtra, Uttarakhand, Karnataka and Sikkim. Okay, Karnataka and Sikkim. So therefore, the center response was, the center has been uh, making it uh, the vaccine availability or the vaccination for the lumpy skin disease uh, is available to the, uh, you know, the cattle population. Okay, so, so when more and more vaccination is being given to the cattle population, they will be protected from the lumpy skin disease. Okay, so they will also develop the herd immunity. They will also develop the herd immunity if we give vaccine or the vaccination is being extended to more and more animals. So what is the lump, uh, herd immunity? Herd immunity is in a particular community of cattle. A few cattle have already developed immunity to the lumpy skin disease and this will either slow down the disease or prevent the disease spread from one animal to the other animal. Okay. So, it will, uh, the vaccination will also make the head immunity a possibility and that will protect the cattle population. Okay. So, this is all about the lumpy skin disease and these are all important and relevant news articles for today's discussion. So, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.